Hello and welcome. Um, so I'm going to start a review series of Norbert Elias's book, The Civilizing Process, written in 1939. He was a German sociologist um, and he wrote about well, if, if various things, but one of those things being the civilizing process um, and manners and um, his style, I would say, is a mixture between between a kind of empirical, historical uh, accounts, uh, sociology, and um, somewhat of a, at least in this text anyway, somewhat of a psychoanalytical angle as well. So in this first section, I'm just going to give an overview. I'm actually not finished the book yet. I'm on. I'm still on the last section. Um, it's quite a long book. I think it's about 500 pages or something like that. So uh, if you're going to read it, you know, be, be prepared. Um, the book is ultimately about, if, if we were going to give it a historical framing, it's ultimately about the turn of a warrior nobility into a courtly nobility, which emerged in the, well, supposed to be the early modern period, you'd say. Although he does go back quite far in his in his research we're talking like you know basically what you would still consider the middle ages i mean 1100s 1200s um but you know things the period he's really interested is in is actually a very neglected period because what most people will talk about is like you had a nobility the ancient regime the ancien regime and then you had the bourgeoisie Whereas what Elias is really interested in this book is what standed in between those two periods, which was, uh, and those two groups, which was the absolute courts, and it was the courtly elite and the courtly, um, the courtly aristocracy. So with Elias, you don't just have you know bourgeoisie and nobility; you have warrior nobility, you have courtly elites, we could say, and you have bourgeoisie. And what Elias argues is that the courtly nobility emerged very powerful because they could mediate between the bourgeoisie and the warrior nobility, who were very different from each other, obviously, and had very opposing <laughs> opinions on how things should be done and so forth. They mediated the two, um, and, they, and, and they oversaw a monopolization of society of at least at least what we would start of what we would later refer to as nations, they they oversaw a monopolization of violence and a monopolization of tax collection, um, which created basically the modern nation. So I'm less interested in the kind of history and more interested in the well, not I would say I'm more interested in the in the philosophical importance of this time period. One can think of Hobbes here, who was, you know, an early modern thinker, um, and uh, was arguing for the monopolization of violence. Basically, that was his main argument: we need to monopolize violence um, uh, under a sovereign rule, a sovereign state, or, or you know. So actually, Hobbes is a, is a good person to bring up here because people get very confused with Hobbes, and they say. But he, but he's a conservative because he's a he's 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 for like absolute uh, monarchs. He's he's for these monarchs having total control. And other people will say, well, no, he's he wants a kind of modern bureaucratic kind of depersonalized state to take to take control. Um, uh, Hobbes is an expression of this time period. I think if you use Norbert Elias's Elias's framework. Um, because Hobbes, because in this time period, basically with the emergence of absolutism, um, and the transition from the warrior elite to the courtly elite, the point is, is monopolization here. Like, like, like bureaucratic, um, kind of uh, bureaucratic procedural depersonalized elites or, a, or a monarch, it doesn't really matter. The point is monopolization.
so we're concerned with monopolization and we're concerned about the transition from a from a warrior elite to a courtly elite this is the sort of main sociological and historical concern of this book this period is where and you know we're talking we're talking about a transition from the medieval period into the early modern period and then basically the modern period this is where our understanding of civility to be civilized emerged from fundamentally now you could go back and say you know paganism to christianity or something right i understand fair enough go back as far as you want but this is the this is the primary um shift which elias is concerned with elias will discuss the um quite peculiar and very um underappreciated influence of certain humanistic thinkers like erasmus for example um or some other kind of church reformers and church leaders um who were creating these kind of mannerly almost like brochures or something like kind of mannerly texts to instruct um young members of the you no know, of the upper classes of the gentry and aristocracies and so forth um of how they should behave at court um erasmus would write these texts and i'll do a separate video on this but they're quite funny actually because you know he he's like telling people not to not to take a piss in front of people or like how to eat their soup or like not to blow their nose at the table or like to not eat meat with their hands eat it with the knife and fork and yeah there's really (laughs) things which seem to us really obvious today but actually clearly at the time weren't that obvious um i'll go over these in more details in more detail in another video but ultimately what Elias does, and he does quite a good long empirical understanding of this, of, of, of these influences. And what he, what, what he basically argues here is that these were originally created for a small subsection of um, elites, particularly younger men, probably, who, you know, were like from noble families or gentry families and, you know, uh, uh, had to go off to marry somebody or had to go off to some sort of social event within the within the other members of the um um upper class and had to behave themselves a certain way so these were useful probably for their parents or for other advisors to give these young men um so that they could conduct themselves appropriately at these events these basically got picked up on by the bourgeoisie and were used it's kind of funny actually and and were used to to mimic aristocratic behavior so the bourgeoisie uh, in this early modern period were getting more and more prestige and getting more and more power and it's it's a myth actually that, that's being created um actually kind of by conservatives that the bourgeoisie were were these kind of rabble rousing um, kind of mob of people who just suddenly killed the aristocracy one day in, in a French revolution. That's absolutely not what happened. Um, y- y- there was a period where the emergence of absolutism sort of stood in between the old warrior nobility and the bourgeoisie. And what and in this period, you basically saw that the warrior nobility was having was was getting less and less power, and the um, 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 um uh, bourgeoisie was getting more and more power so the bourgeoisie was kind of cozying up to the to the monarchs and to the um you know uh, uh, members of the royal upper class of society and it, it, through courts and through courtly behaviors there was an opportunity there for the bourgeoisie to sort of get in with, as we would put it today, the people at the head of the table. Um, And they picked up on these texts, which originally weren't meant for them. And they they started to mimic. Somewhat like mimesis, we could even say. This is probably an early version of of what would would later call 
mimesis, um, started to mimic the kind of courtly behaviors of um, that were being um, encouraged in uh, a small group of people within particularly young men of aristocratic families. Um, Elias is, is, is concerned with this role of mediation between the, the warrior nobles and the bourgeoisie because he sees the absolute courts as basically functioning as a, medi- as, as a mediation between these two groups. And therefore, what happened was you had a de-warrior, a de-warriorization of the warriors and, and it kind of tamed them it made them more mannerly, more, um, more, um, um, sort of, we could say, you know, more mannerly, more delicate, more refined. And it also made the bourgeoisie more aristocratic. (laughs) So, so you have this kind of, this kind of androgenizing effect. The, 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 the bourgeoisie is becoming more aristocratic and the warriors are in a sense becoming less aristocratic. Um, is a, the absolute courts are having an, an androgenizing effect on the character of the medieval period, basically. The, the character of the medieval period had, had created. So again, within this period, it's all about monopolization. Monopolizing the right to use violence and monopolizing the... Um, um, tax collecting capacities of the society. So, as things were being monopolized in that sense, you saw a centralization, maybe, of, of the character of the society um, tor- towards something which the courtly nobility um, represented, which was then being posited ultimately as a civilized ideal. This is this is the main, I suppose we could say, thesis here, is that a civilized ideal came from the absolute courts and the courtly, um, and the transition from a from a warrior nobility to a courtly nobility, and within that ideal, it infused elements of the bourgeoisie into it, and it tamed the warrior character basically of the nobility. So again, I'll probably do a, like a longer video on some of these particularities, but um, for now we can say that's the kind of historical and sociological framework. So I'll do, a, I'll do, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the 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 psychic um, economy and, and and the changes in the psychic economy, which occurred in this period. And I think this is this is extremely important, as I mentioned earlier, with Hobbes because Hobbes was like we can sort of understand now that this period of absolutism. This early modern period um, was um, 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 interested in monopolization, but it, but but you know, this monopolization was not just something which occurs legally, right, or materially, or purely through authority and control of having exclusive control of the military. Or the or the banking system or something, which which today again we take for granted because we, we live in such a monopolized um, society that uh, we truly take it for granted how unmonopolized things were in 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 the med- in the uh, Middle Ages. But the changes in the psychic economy which occurred here are actually fun, really profound. Um, if you're in, if you if you've read Nietzsche, you will probably think of Nietzsche when I talked about the taming of the nobility, um, and I think this is an interesting text because it doesn't do this somewhat naive. Again, like Nietzsche, I I think I think Elias here is a good supplement to read if you're interested in Nietzsche because at least this text anyway, because Nietzsche is is psychologically. A genius, but he's historically stupid sometimes. Sometimes, he, you know, the slave morality, you know, which suddenly occurred sometime. I presume he's sort of implicitly referring to Christianity falling. Sorry, Roman Empire falling and Christianity emerging. Yes, that is important. Um, but it sort of doesn't give us a whole lot to work with 
if we want to understand like Nietzsche, Nietzschean psychology, it doesn't give it doesn't give us a whole lot to work with if we're going back that far. Um, so much has happened since then, like, and you know you can think of various uh, historical realities. For example, the Crusades, or um, or just Christian medieval life is is so you know, uh, p- particularly with the knights, it's so contrary to the sort of Christianity that, which Nietzsche is describing. So I think that, you know, if, if we take this period of the transition from medieval to early modern, from warrior nobles to courtly nobles and the integration of the bourgeoisie and so forth, I think that gives us a better historical understanding of, 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 the, of, of the sorts of Nietzschean psychological observations which are are you know important to, to to think about today but ultimately and i'm not sure if elias i'm sure he's read nietzsche but because uh, because elias wrote this in 1939 and you know nietzsche was obviously writing a long long time before that so um what they both have in common is an understanding of um um, um the dynamics of constraint of the constraint of aggressive impulses um, and the importance of understanding the historical and psychological kind of um, inf- uh, realities which oversee the constraint and the release of aggressive impulses within a society. And how that, that, that dynamic between r- release and constraint seems to form a ideal or a kind of ideal of being civilized, right? Um, Nietzsche, if you've read Genealogy of Morals in particular, you'll know that Nietzsche proposed that slave morality was basically the, um, the would not withdrawal, the constraint of releasing aggressive impulses against someone who's hurt you, injured you, betrayed you, offended you. Um, okay, when I say offend, I don't mean offend in the modern sense where you're offended by everything, but in some significant fundamental way, you know, um, the, the, the weakness and incapacity to release that, that indignation, um, to, to express that indignation for Nietzsche, Christianity created a metaphysical construct to deal with that um particularly the afterlife and hell you know your your enemies are going to burn forever because they've punished you or maybe because they're better than you in some way um uh, cope basically as we would put it today right cope christianity for nietzsche created this kind of of coping civilization um and it, it, it we could argue that it was successful um because 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 it's it, it structured the psychic economy away from releasing aggressive impulses in an immediate and real sense and uh, re- release those in a metaphysical sense now by doing so you create a whole host of other problems to do with values to do with morals to do with beauty to do with health and so forth and so forth which is basically what Nietzsche is always talking about right Elias here is somewhat similar because less polemic I obviously he's more of a kind of act he's more of a scholar than Nietzsche but um but he he has a similar understanding in the sense of he thinks that the the the, the civilized ideal that, that emerged is basically emerged emerges on the condition of a constraint of releasing aggressive impulses on others and the complexity interdependence and monopolization of society which emerged in the in, in the early modern period with forces of economization marketization monopolies on violence and tax collection and so forth basically created a structure in which codependencies between different groups ended up um, making the capacity to express aggressive energies towards each other more and more difficult and more and more costly. So what happens is 
authority is given to those who are very who are very good at, 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 at withholding um, aggression. So basically, you have the warrior elites who aren't very good at that. They're very good at lots of things. They're very good at fighting. They're very good. They're very brave. You know, they're very good at navigation. They're very good at building. You know, but they're not very good in this in this way of um, dealing with complex group dynamics where there's lots of interdependency. Um, um, th therefore, you start to have a replacement of them as an elite, and you start to have a have, have a, a, a radical shift in in the psychic economy of the societies of the time, and you start to have a also you start to have a change in what is idealized as like who should we who should we emulate who who should we be like what is a what is a civilized good person what does that look like and and increasingly become someone who fits to some extent or another, a kind of Nietzschean critique of someone who is tamed. So I'll probably, I'll do, an, I'll do more videos and get into kind of the particularities of, of this. Um, uh, but uh, it would be worth maybe acknowledging why this not very well-known book um, is worth reading today. Because I think that the the psychic economy which we live in today and i think that this makes sense if you think about things like excessive emphasis on tolerance you know <laughs> like a, a tendency to try punish like hate speech or something right like all uh, aggressive expressions of aggressive of aggressive um um uh, uh expressions of of aggressivity no matter how justified you are in um being angry or indignant or fed up or even just annoyed by something. I think that the past 20 years in particular in our society, and I think you can think of political correctness, but you can also just think of um, uh, hate speech laws. You can think of excessive emphasis on tolerance. You can think of the kind of aggressive deconstruction of masculinity. Um, and of course, an emergence of a managerial elite, which is not exclusive to our, by any means, well, well none of this is exclusive to our decade or something. This all goes back uh, much longer, but all of this could be understood better within what Elias was actually describing within a, within a um, 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 tension and dynamic between kind of a warrior nobility and a courtly nobility. To what extent the the psychic the psychic economy of aggression and the withdraw the, the the constraint and the expression of that of that of those um, drives has determined politics history civilization and so forth is really an unanswered question to this day and there's actually been very little um, uh, proper thinking done it done about it and i think that that's probably also because we've had a clerical and what you might call kind of managerial um um institutional institutions who haven't really facilitated and funded and provided space for an honest thinking in this regard likely because they have to criticize themselves so much if they do it that they just don't want to do it you also have the problem of the medieval period being that uh, uh, warriors didn't write most of the time. Like the knights were these elites that didn't weren't very good at reading or writing and many of them couldn't. So we don't know what they thought about things. We don't know how they experienced things. We, we don't know. Like, um, um, and I think that this was probably one of the fa historical factors which led to an academic and, and intellectual world run by <coughs> people which, who, who Nietzsche would probably have a lot of funny and uh, offensive things to say about. I think this book is useful as well. Um, again, again, I'll, I'll get into this stuff in more detail in a later section, but I think this is useful uh, in the sense that it, 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 sort of, it sort of describes something which, for example, Freud never really talked about, which is class. And we were talking about not just class in, in the kind of traditional sense of bourgeoisie and proletariat, but, but uh, 
class in a hierarchical level and also different sections of different of, of the same class for example the you know the distinction between a warrior subsection of the elite and the courtly subsection of the elite um uh, for, if, you, if you take freud for example Freud will write about, you know, civilization and discontents. It will talk about this imposition that civilization has on all of us. Um, now, he's a more of a libidinal understanding of these things, but it ultimately does come down to the same thing, which is a, um, which is a, um, the more complex a civilization, and he's completely right about this, and he's, he's completely in, you know, he's completely, he's completely in agreement here with, with Norbert Elias. Um, the more complex a civilization, there tends to be a higher pressure of restraint um so civilization is necessarily repressive in some form or another and it's the trade-off we make for that civilization completely in agreement with elias here absolutely nothing wrong with that problem is well two things um the uh, freud was fundamentally interested in sexuality and the libido and repression on a libidinal level so he didn't really take the repression of aggression, repression of aggression, um, uh, to be significant in and of itself. It's a kind of subsection of of libidinal repression. So um, Elias seems to me that he does take this seriously in and of itself. He's more similar to Nietzsche in that regard. Um, it, psychoanalysis is probably the most sophisticated form of thinking about dynamics of repression within modern society, but it's never really taken aggression to be of, of importance in and of itself. And here, Elias actually is, has, has, has written a book which has started to, um, which is, which is, which we could say is the beginning of that project that was never, Never has which has never been completed, which is basically Nietzsche's project as well. The other thing which I would say, and I'll finish this little overview in a minute, but the other thing I would say which is of um, most importance here within this book is this: Freud also doesn't give us an understanding of why psychological problems are worse for people with more money, like. It's really obvious today that people from the middle and upper middle classes have the worst psychology in general than people from the lower classes, from working classes and so on, or, or, or lower middle classes. Like, this is, a, this is such a taboo. This is such a taboo to this day that we cannot say, why are the successful people fucked up? <laughs> like, we're not, allowed to, we're not allowed to point this out. And... I think it's it's largely because it 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 de in it disenchants the you know the kind of um, the psychic economy itself even just to observe that because because we're so because you know parents that are lower middle class are supposed to teach their kids how to be middle class and people that are working class are supposed to be teaching their kids how to be lower middle class and there's this kind of emphasis on social mobility which we have in education and um education and culture and so on and to point out the the fact that it seems to be that people from certain um sections of society who have more money more status are more miserable and it's not just that they're more miserable because that's that's something which we we, we like to romanticize a little bit like oh the misery and suffering of life they're, they're like fundamentally more disturbed. Like they're fundamentally more screwed up. <laughs> like this is something we're not allowed to discuss because it disenchants the whole power of social mobility, which drives so much of our society and our economy and our, and our values and so on today. So, but what Elias points out is that basically, since the change from a warrior to a to a to a um, um, courtly nobility that actually hierarchical development is structured on basically extreme psychological um, um, restraints 
on you and therefore the incapacity to act, to express. And even I would say today to think, I would say that this emphasis on on civility and courtliness, of course, you know, one can say there they are or like one can argue that they are anything today and we have to pretend to agree with them because that's what civilized people do we're not allowed to think <laughs> like we're not allowed to point out like minimal contradictions so this emphasis on kind of you know courtly civility which which the middle classes have structured themselves on for hundreds of years now um has ended up actually causing like radical philosophical problems radical psychological problems and uh, particularly i think within the post-industrial society where where you you not only have this historical emphasis on on restriction of aggressive impulses but you have a emphasis on kind of managerial um um uh, uh, competence which I think intensifies the repression um, to the point of people just completely losing any sense of like who they are, what they are, or what the point of anything is, and so on. Nietzsche would say slave morality won. Basically, this is this is the kind of point that Nietzsche would say, uh, and I think he, I think he's right. I think that there's something to that. Um, I'm not in agreement with Nietzsche on every, in every single thing he said, but but I think that he was ultimately right about something that we need to lose our arrogant sense of um, moral and, and civilizational superiority because the capacity to restrict one's annoyance, aggression, and indignation at every, at every possible moment doesn't really create good people. Now, there may be some necessity for restricting your aggressive impulses for cooperation and so forth in different ways if there if there's a if there's a justifiable goal to reach for example um all human organization is going to have to be somewhat restrictive um in order to reach a higher common goal but i'm not sure you have that anymore i think that what's happened is that you have a restrictiveness for the sake of restrictiveness. I think you have a kind of social currency of tolerance and of um, tamed and of castrated, which, 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 which people want to signal. It's a kind of social currency, um, uh, and and even when there are, when there are no, like numerous situations where we should be more indignant, and we should be more. Um, 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 uh, angry about things, it, it becomes an offense to that social currency to do so. Um, and you end up actually with people that aren't more disciplined, they're just kind of more undignified. 